So I wanted to talk about eating roadkill and uh, it's something that I do fairly frequently and have no problem with at all but some people including a lot of hunters actually get very uh, upset about it. Um, part of the reason for that is that there are possible dangers involved with eating roadkill which I'll talk about and also um, if you are a connoisseur of, of game and venison then sometimes roadkill isn't as nice but if you deal with it correctly and you know which which animals to choose as it were then uh, there's no reason why it can't be really really good meat. Uh, my freezer is kept stocked kind of year round with things that I just find as I'm driving around. So first things first, when you've seen an animal by the side of the road how do you know how fresh it is, whether it's worth picking up and, uh, and if it's still alive what do you do with it as well. So the first thing is quite often uh, you'll be looking for roadkill on a route that you drive regularly so your route to work, your route to drop off the kids at school, that sort of thing. So you'll know most likely whether it has appeared there in the last 24 hours or not. With practice you can also get quite good at, at kind of telling by the way it's lying. Once an animal has died um, it begins to stiffen, that's what we call rigor mortis, and that starts at the extremities and works back towards the middle and the animal takes on a kind of a stiff appearance in the way it's lying. Um, by then it's, it's cooled down. The rigor mortis then goes again and the animal becomes floppy and then it begins to um, bloat basically. And obviously that happens a lot quicker in warm weather. In warmer weather that can happen very, very quickly, uh, even before the rigor mortis has gone. So you've got to be careful with that. Personally, I don't like to eat things that are bloaty because they taste foul. I've spotted this lovely thing. Um, so this is a roebuck. It's been dead since the weekend apparently, obviously a road casualty with that damage to the fur on his flank there. Um, and you can see that um, he's a bit, he's a bit bloated. The abdomen is very firm, the eyes have been had out by crows, nice antlers though. Um, and there's a bit of um, sort of weeping out of the rear end um, as the as the animal starts to bloat so if I was desperate I could still eat it but I'm not so we're going to have some bones the skull and those antlers and uh, possibly even the skin but we'll see how how it is once I get into it so the things you're looking for are has it appeared recently is it at the side of the road ideally not squashed in good nick um, once you've found somewhere safe to pull over and hopped out to have a look, the things you're looking for are how damaged is it? Okay, if it's a really fast road and it's been hit by something big moving very fast, there might be not a lot that's worth saving, I'll be honest. The best meat is in this area here and uh, along the back. And if that's been contaminated with, with gut contents, then you really don't want to be messing with that because it's it's just not very nice. So you can have a bit of a poke of it and you can listen to uh, where has it got broken bones. And you can look at if the skin on the tummy where there's less fur has started to go green, that's not a nice sign. Best thing is to look at the eyes as well. Look at the eyes and see are they still wet and shiny looking, have they clouded over yet? And that can give you an indication as to how fresh it is. If there's any blood by the head or, or wherever it's been hit, you can have a look at is that blood dry, is it still bright red, has it started to dry and turn brown? That's a really good clue as well. If you find a deer or are unfortunate enough to hit one, then you need um, something to, to help you kill it. You're not going to be able to do this by hand. You need a knife or you need something really, really heavy. Um, legally, I don't know exactly where you stand on, on dispatching things. Um, there is always the option to call the police who will call someone on the Humane Dispatch list, but that might be a while uh, and they'll come out and shoot it. However, if you're confident doing it and you have the means to do it, then with a, particularly with a small deer like this, it is, it is perfectly doable. Be aware that you know, this animal, for all that it's quite small, is really strong and it does not want to die, however gravely injured it is, and it will hurt you. Um, this particular type of deer is a muntjac, and they actually have fangs, which are really sharp. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want to get caught with those, and they've got these very effective pointy little antlers as well. Obviously with something bigger, like a, a big stag, I wouldn't go near it. Uh, 
ask me unless it was really, really bad. So you want to approach it from this direction, from its back. Um, hopefully that won't spook it either. It could be struggling, it could be thrashing around. I just don't know. If you have something heavy like a tire iron, the bit you want to aim for is here, um, the back of the head. It's actually quite hard on Munchak because of the position of their antlers, but the, the back of the head here is the, the thinnest piece of skull and that's where you're going to get it. Um, if you don't have that, then what you need to do, I'm just going to move this a little bit so we can see a bit better, is you need to pin it down. The back legs and the head are the most dangerous bits of the animal um, and sort of the hardest to control. So I would get my foot on its shoulder, hold its front legs down, its back legs can do whatever they want over there and they can't get me. And then if you want to cut the animal's throat, okay, it's, you don't go through from the outside because you're cutting through fur and it, it just won't go through. Um, you can hold the head down like that. You want to come right back around by the jawbone, poke through and then out. Uh, and you should see quite a substantial amount of blood coming out. The reflex, the blinking reflex and the um, pupillary reflex is about the last thing to go. So if you can just lightly touch the, the eyelids or the eyeball and there's no reflex at all, then the animal is dead. I always like to have some really strong bin bags, a knife, obviously there's legal issues with that, but I, I usually have a knife, preferably not a folding one, although that's even more difficult legally. Um, folding ones are very hard to clean. Uh, disposable gloves, depending on the, the job you do and how hard it will be to get your hands clean. Some water, hand wipes to clean your hands, that sort of thing. If you're picking things up primarily for the skins, things like foxes and that sort of thing, then salt is very handy as well so that you can preserve the skin um, even if you're not going home straight away. So we've got a dead deer. Okay, I found this one this morning. I'm pretty sure it died last night. It's just coming out of rigor mortis, um, but it hasn't yet really started to bloat. It's a little bit, um, getting a little bit bloaty here, but we're good. Um, I haven't managed to identify where the main damage on this deer is yet. The leg bones seem intact. There's damage to the head. Um, some sort of scavenger has actually had a bit of a nibble at it and taken its ears and its tail, which is odd. Never seen that before. Um, but we'll, we'll try and get a bit of a picture of, of the health this animal was in before it died and also you know, what kind of damage there is to the meat as they go on. If you found an animal, something as small as a rabbit, all the way up to a deer, your main priority when you find it is to get the guts out. Okay, make sure it's dead, ideally bleed it if, and get the guts out. All of the bacteria that are in the guts will carry on producing gases and nasty chemicals and that taints them. This is a boy deer, okay, we've got his testicles there. They can be got rid of because they're sort of in the way. So I'm just going through the skin and then I want to separate the skin from the underlying muscle layer, the layer that would be a six pack in a human. Most of skinning is actually using your fingers, using your hands more than using the knife. Okay, if you get any areas that do stick, then that's where the knife comes in. And you don't need a big knife for this. There's no need for like a hunting knife or a gooey knife or anything like that. And the movement I'm kind of doing is that. So I'm pushing along and then pushing down. I've now separated the two layers. You can see here's the, the sort of muscle layer and here's the, the skin layer. And I'm just gonna work my way up. If you go straight through into the inner muscle layer, not only is there a danger that you're going to puncture some, some guts, it's also harder to get the skin off clean. You can, of course, do all this with it hanging up as well. I prefer to do it on the floor, to be honest, especially if I've got nice clean grass to do it on. Just to note, if you're if you're butchering stuff outdoors, um, what you can do is put down a layer of green, preferably non-poisonous, plentiful vegetation like uh, burdock leaves or like fresh green grass or something like that, and use that as your prep surface. So I've got to be careful here because there are some guts showing through, so that's obviously a bit of damage from the, the accident there. Okay, so you can see it's beginning to bloat, there's a bit of gas in there. Okay. So there's the stomach, okay, with its chambers. I'll talk about that later because there are some uses we can put that to. Um, and what I'm feeling for is about here is the diaphragm. Okay, so that's the, the bit that spasms when you hiccup. Um, 
and through that is the esophagus which obviously I don't want to leak so I have all of that out okay you can see green matter in there fortunately this hasn't ruptured which is excellent news I can't remember which one's which but you've got the reticulum the amassum the abomasum and the rumen um, this is the rumen, the big one. There are rumens like uh, cattle. But one of these chambers has a really, I think it's this one, has a really beautiful texture like honeycomb. And I'll be taking this out to tan it. But that is a disgusting job, um, which I will uh, probably do when I get home. All sorts of things. It's also, from a hunting point of view and, and general wildlife awareness point of view, um, it can be really interesting to see what the animal was eating. Now, what I'm looking for is the liver, because that's really important in working out whether this animal is healthy or not, and whether it's one to eat or whether it's one to put back at the roadside. Okay, so we've got some intestines here. Okay, that discoloration doesn't necessarily mean anything's leaked through a hole, but it does mean that things were starting to seep through. Okay, so it's not ideal, but it doesn't smell horrific, so... This is, um, this is by no means a lost cause. So this is the liver. There's nothing really that I can see untoward. Um, just looking for any hard white spots, rough edges or any blister-like structures, anything like that. This is damage from the, the accident. It's probably um, hit against a broken bone or just the sheer kinetic en energy has done that. What you can do is cut into the liver and um, if there are any fluke worms and things, you run your knife over it and you'll see all these little wormy heads poking up, which is disgusting. If it's really fresh and there's not a lot of damage on the inside, you can eat the liver. You just want to make sure you get the gallbladder out, which I've lost. I think the gallbladder may have actually been ruptured. Quite a lot of free blood in here. Um, there's also a kidney. Where's the other kidney out? The other kidney is demolished. Oop. Okay. Now I can also see the bladder um, here, which is empty, and a little bit of intestine. So what we want to do is get as much of that out as possible without contaminating the meat with the, the contents of the guts. One other thing you could carry is actually cable tie. You can cable tie off the end of the intestines to stop any bits that you can get out leaking into the body cavity and likewise the top of the esophagus so that is just clotted blood um, and bits of organ so that shows some of the damage um, that's been done i'm being quite careful here because i'm, I'm guessing there's some broken ribs and broken bones can be very sharp and if they give you a jab then you're looking at some potentially unpleasant infections yourself now up in here we have the heart It's a lovely thing to eat and I would just fry that in some hot oil and have it on toast. We should have some lungs in here as well. Now it does make me think about our ancestors and kind of they must have actually had a pretty good knowledge of anatomy and trauma, uh, traumatic injuries because they were taking apart animals that had um, been, been hunted, been killed in a variety of ways from traps to various weapons and it does teach you about the kind of injuries that happen from different impacts and um, it does make me think. The esophagus is that as the animal starts to bloat, which it had done a little bit, um, matter from the stomach gets pushed up the esophagus and, uh, and then you've taken the stomach out of the equation that can leak back down. The neck is really tough, that will be the hardest bit to cut through. Out. You see I've just slid the knife along under the skin cut through like that. That's fairly clean but there's a bit of an edge that's going to be a pest. Okay and then in here I can separate those muscle groups quite simply. There's the windpipe there and right behind it you should see the esophagus there. I normally do this bit at the roadside if I can because I don't want to have to dispose of all this stuff once I get home. So we've got the guts out and uh, separated the skin up all the way to the neck and that, uh, that means it's time to start the rest of the skinning. 
at this point you could leave it you could hang it outside for a couple of well even a couple of days in cool weather as long as you can protect it from insects but personally i prefer to just get it chopped up and in the freezer as soon as i can or to, to make it into jerky or whatever i'm doing now it all looks very uh, messy in here but hopefully that will become clearer as we move on